<laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a beautiful, sunny Friday afternoon here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I'm at. Um, and it sounds like everybody else is having a good Friday, too. So welcome to another Small Grains Brewing and Distilling Happy Hour. This week, we're talking terroir of both hops and barley. And our first presenter today is Dr. Rob Sarain of Michigan State University, and he'll be giving us a rundown of the most current research that he is privy to on uh, hop terroir. Yes, I used the word privy. So without further ado, take it away, Rob. And terroir. <laughs> Good work, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Hey, everyone. Um, sorry we had to change up the, the order a little bit here. I've got to take my kids down to a basketball game, so I have to leave in about a half an hour. But um, hopefully we'll get through this. And if you have questions, happy to answer those as well. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, hopefully this works. Well, it's, is it working on your guys' end? Yep. Come on, come on. There we go. All right. All right. Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about hop terroir and some of the research that we've been doing, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the uh, other partners on the project. Uh, Aaron Staples is a graduate student at MSU, uh, working with Dr. Trey Malone, another project partner. Uh, Dr. Jan Jones is a... Uh, um, runs a chemistry lab at MSU. Alex Adams has a, he's the CEO of Cambium Analytica. It's a cannabis testing lab up here in Traverse City. Uh, he's also working with us to test hops as well, run analytics. Uh, Alec Mull, probably know, vice president of founders. Uh, Scott Stir is a brewer at uh, Silver Spruce Brewing uh, in Traverse City, and he brewed the beer for some of the work that I'll talk about. Um, so, as you probably all know, if you're interested in craft beer, things have changed quite a bit in the last 15 or so years, 20 years. Uh, most of the hops grown in the U.S. were for uh, alpha, for bittering, and with craft beer, they kind of kind of switched, and so now 70 to 80 percent are grown for aroma. Uh, this is a really cool paper uh, in the MBA Technical Quarterly that we kind of pulled from. Um, to do some of the work that we did. And it's uh, the language of hops, how to assess hop flavor in, in hops and beer. And it's a like a three-page paper, but it's really cool. Uh, some researchers from Barth Haas worked with a, a professional perfumer to um, develop uh, uh, categories for of aroma. And he came up with 16. They kind of whittled it down to uh, 12 um, different categories. Um, so they had a, a common language with how to kind of talk about um, hop aroma and so we, we borrowed that and you know probably know uh, hops each cop, hop cultivar has uh, a unique f flavor profile um, mainly due to the essential oils there's um, over 400 different volatiles that they've identified there's probably you know over a thousand out there uh, the this shows cascade on the left and chinook on the right and um, you can see the, the, on this flavor wheel um, the, the different uh, flavor profiles of hops. So genetics play a role. Here's a, uh, another chart from um, a talk that Dr. Anne Van Hall in Belgium has done. She's done some really cool research on, on hop terroir, um, looking at uh, GC mass spec. Um, she broke all of these uh, volatiles down and into these pie charts and these are these each circle represents a different um, hop cultivar um, amarillo top left um, centennial bottom left and you can see the the flavor profile is different depending upon the cultivar so so we know that genetics play a role and so does location so on the left here you have cascade hops grown in belgium and in the u.s um, same kind of hop aroma analytical wheel um, same exact cultivar, but totally different flavor profile uh, of the hop. And on the right, um, carrying it all the way through to beer, you can see um, it carries through to beer as well. So um, this, is this is, I think, pretty interesting um, for multiple reasons, but uh, one of the reasons she wanted to do the work because uh, it was for kind of consistency. So brewers knew that they were getting a consistent product. And so Cascade is not equal to Cascade, depending upon where it's grown. Um, and so this is what I'm talking about here. So you've got a 
Cascade from New Zealand, and the yellow uh, represents uh, the raw hop, and the green is a cold infusion, so that's two grams of pellets dissolved in 200 milliliters of water, um, kind of to simulate what it would uh, the flavor would be from dry hopping. Same exact variety, um, you know, you look at the raw hops for uh, the Cascade grown in, in Washington, red berry flavor is prominent, maybe a little cream caramel. Uh, in New Zealand, it's more citrus green fruits. Um, and uh, this is in the Hallertau in Germany, also different. So uh, New Zealand went as far as just renaming that hop altogether. Um, they call it Tahiki now, and that's basically a Cascade hop, but it was so different that uh, they needed to rename it. So what role does the environment play is kind of what we're looking at. Um, and then, you know, probably three or four years ago, we started uh, this research and really started to investigate it. And then we heard more and more. This is um, Luponic Distortion Series uh, 006, uh, Matt Bernelson at Firestone Walker. And he brewed this beer with uh, all Michigan hops. And you can you know, read his quote. Uh, typically, the Chinook is kind of a piney grapefruit. Um, but when he brewed it with Michigan Chinook, it was more Mandarin orange. Uh, and so we we're getting this like anecdotal um, evidence from brewers uh, that we thought was pretty cool. So, you know, let's, let's start thinking about this. Let's talking about it. Let's start researching it if we can. So what is terroir? It's, um, and this is kind of the background of, of why we, at least how my brain worked is I'm, I started looking at other crops and secondary metabolites that were developed in, uh, in different crops, um, sometimes as a, a reaction to pest pressure or the environment, uh, as opposed to, you know, the primary metabolites, which the plant needs for growth and reproduction. So it happens in all these different crops. Uh, there's many factors, genetic, environmental, biological, that play a role. Um, but terroir is definitely associated with wine in viticulture where that climate, soil, um, and the vine all interact uh, to contribute to a distinct sensory attribute. So, so the reason we kind of got into this was also consistency and quality control, um, but more so uh, to see if there is a way that our growers could differentiate their, their crop um, and not necessarily have to compete with the big guys out west. So we acquired uh, four different Chinook samples from um, different eco-regions across the U.S., two from different spots in uh, Michigan, and then one from Washington and one from Oregon. Uh, we ran analytics on those, and then we did a, a blind taste test at the Hop and Barley Conference just before um, COVID kind of took over, uh, and then surveyed brewers as well. And this is what's kind of cool. Um, so we ran uh, this chemical analysis, and so the, the ones on the left, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. So this is a Michigan hop, this is a Michigan hop, A and B, and then C is Oregon and D is Washington. And we ran these for probably 30 different um, volatiles. Um, beta mercine, that's kind of that grassy flavor uh, that you get. Um, geranyl acetate is uh, that rose type of aroma, and interestingly, um, one of the hops from Michigan, uh, or one of the Chinook samples, was huge. It had a, a really big um, part per million, and the other one had none, or at least no detectable. And then this is Oregon and Washington. Um, what, we, what we thought was pretty cool, just based upon um, you know, some of the, the anecdotal evidence I talked about, is that n the Michigan hops had no alpha pinene, uh, or at least it was undetectable, so maybe that's why you know, it was less piney. Um, Savonine is a woody, spi spicy, kind of citrus terpy flavor, and for some reason, uh, the Michigan ones had more. Um, and uh, we, uh, my um, colleague Aaron Lazat and I are doing a podcast, and we just talked to John Henning. It should be coming out in, in the next month or so. And we asked him about this, this you know, in, in breeding and, and the terroir and whatever, and he basically said the same thing. It's that, you know, um, there's uh, methylated DNA in all plants and depending upon environmental factors, some of those will get expressed at different times. So 
it, the genetics and the environment play a role. So I thought that was interesting, thought that was pretty interesting. And then we started talking a little bit more to Alex at uh, Cambium Analytica and started thinking about, well, what about all these monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes? And these are the secretary. This is a really cool book, by the way. Sorry. Um, Hobbes of Cultivation, Composition and Usage. Uh, cool chart out of that book, thinking about or, or looking at secondary metabolites and the essential oils and what percent of um, these essential oils are made up by these um, uh, different compounds and so we were looking at you know the terpenes but esters also play a role and increasingly there's evidence that thiols even play a role uh, in in some of these flavor even in like parts per trillion so um, this is kind of the the next step we think in, in trying to figure out yes terpenes play a role um, first of all does that carry through to the beer um, yeast has an effect as well so um, uh, yeast can play a role in, in that biotransformation. Um, uh, so there's all these other factors. And so then we started talking, well, this would be really cool to figure out. And then, you know, look at all these esters. And, and then you have this thing called uh, these entourage effects where, you know, certain compounds interacting together can produce uh, stronger aromas. And pretty soon you're uh, you're digging into the rabbit hole there, and you know in the end, did uh, Trappist monks have access to a, a GCMS? Probably not. Um, so the you know the key is is the beer good? Then that's that's kind of your first step. But you know as a as a scientist and someone who thinks about this stuff, I think it's it, it's kind of cool to keep keep thinking about it. So. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna keep investigating it, and then you know what factors in the field could you adjust to bring out certain flavors and different hops. Uh, anyways, it just keeps me awake at night in a cool way. Um, so we built we brewed a, a five barrel uh, um, a beer. Uh, there's the wort, um, the malt bill, the uh, hop edition for for bittering. Went in uh, fermented with zero zero one yeast from White Labs. And then you can see the temperature change and all that. And then we transferred to four one barrel fermenters and then dry hopped with Chinook from each of the different locations. And we tried to do this the year before, just beer, brewing beer um, on separate days, but even the color of the beer was different. And so we kind of came up with this system. So really the only thing that's changed is the dry hop um, Chinook. And we thought that that would give us a better idea of exactly the contribution of, of those Chinook hops, which it did. Um, however, you know, if we were to do this again and talking to Alec Mall, he thinks we should, you know, add, add those hops when the beer is still warm. He thinks you'd get a, a better, um, it'd, it'd be easier to tell the difference or distinguish between the hops and probably add more hops too. Uh, it, was a, it was a really good beer. Um, so we did this blind taste test at the Hop and Barley Conference. We didn't use as many of the categories as, as uh, Barth Haas because even though it says beer professionals, there were brewers there, um, a few of them, and folks that work in the brewing industry, but it was also a lot of growers that might not be, um, might not have had a lot of sensory training. So there were some differences in uh, alpha and in aroma based upon those tests. Um, and if we were we were planning on doing this at uh, the pub in Travers as well, and having the four options at the pub, and then having just consumers come in and rate those, but COVID hit, so we weren't able to do that. So, uh, but that's another thing that we'd really like to do. Um, and then we had uh, uh, kind of a, as an aside this the survey that was sent out to Michigan brewers asking, you know, what would you prefer for pelleted hops if um, all the other attributes are the same, if they're grown in your home state, grown in the Great Lakes region, grown in the Pacific Northwest, Global Gap certified, or none. And with everything else remaining equal, the brewers are willing to pay 35% more for hops that were grown in state. So, and we try to, you know, tease this apart and um, think there's a, a definitely a brewer preference for local um, that consumers could, would be willing to pay more and that, um, Local hops taste different than non-local hops. 
And then along the same lines here, uh, you know, what are the following initiatives incentivize you to, to use more local hops in your brewery? Uh, the, the main one uh, is a probably yes or definitely yes, um, is that uh, locally unique cultivars are really interested in experimenting. That's probably similar uh, across the country. Uh, in improved cultivar selection, you know, if you kind of put those two together, they're really interested in unique um, aromatic hops that no one else can get. So what are some of the marketing implications of this? Uh, I think craft brewers are looking for ways to differentiate. Uh, the growers are searching for ways to kind of overcome production and marketing challenges, and, and this is potential here. If they can get a premium for the hops that are grown here by marketing um, a unique flavor profile. So that's about all I have right now. I guess I can also add that Hopefully in the next couple months here, we're getting we're getting a bunch of hop samples in from uh, all over the state, and those uh, spider web charts we're hoping to develop for as kind of a, a Michigan um, typical cultivar um, based upon sensory and analytics that uh, we can go back and compare against every year, and then as well compare those against uh, hop the same cultivars from other locations. So I'll stop my. Uh, show here and stop sharing and got a few minutes to answer questions if anyone has any awesome thank you rob um yeah. there was a the first question to drop in the chat was um tom was wondering if the paper or papers that you're referencing are available uh, and published online yeah sure um let's see which ones i referenced <laughs> um Oh, the, the one from, yeah, yeah, yeah. The MBAA, I think you have to be a member to uh, access that one, um, but you might be able to find it online somewhere. And then Ann Van Halls, she has quite a few papers out there as well. Um, sometimes you can find these by doing like a Google Scholar search. Um, if not, shoot me an email and I can send you both of those okay. if you can't find them. Cool. And my email is... Um, S-I-R-R-I-N-E at uh, M-S-U dot E-D-U. I'll write it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, Jeff. Uh, oh, hey, Jeff. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Jeff. Uh, he dropped a book recommendation into the chat. So. Cool. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Cool. Um, let's open it up. Anybody have any questions uh, for Rob? All right. Um, hey, hey, Rob. The, oh, this yeah. is sorry. Um, yeah, I, I had heard from uh, one grower in Michigan that the Cascades were so different, perceived so different by brewers that they had to change the name to sell it. Uh, and it was the, the quality was excellent, but it was so different that they could not sell it as Cascade. That, um, yeah, that wouldn't surprise just, me at all. Could you just comment on that? Just, just saying. <laughs> yeah, that that wouldn't surprise me at all. In fact, that's what they did in New Zealand. Uh, and you know, I think it's important if folks do that, though, that they're you know if they're trademarking something that you know at least they're open about what it actually is. But, you know, calling it something different, I think, might actually help brewers because if they're expecting, you know, a certain flavor profile from a Cascade and then it, you're giving them something locally and it, it screws up the recipe, they're not going to be happy. So um, that's what we're hoping to do for, for these brewers or for the growers to go and take to brewers is, you know, these spider web charts that are comparisons of, uh, based upon sensory, of, hey, here's your standard cascade flavor profile and then here's what it is in michigan and then even here's what it is for the that specific yard that specific grower's yard so yeah we're doing a i don't i think i meant i don't know if i mentioned this but we're offering a a, a sensory training with um, university of vermont over the next uh, month and a half um and i can also send that to ryan to send out uh, i think the deadline's coming up but it'll be really cool um roy de is at uvm and uh he's got 
tons of experiment, uh, experience in, in sensory uh, training and analysis, and he'll be sending each of the participants like a whole package of uh, items that they'll have, and they'll be able to sit and do this sensory training online with everyone else. So it's kind of a cool idea. So we're hoping to get the growers involved in that so they can do some of this themselves then to give to growers. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> Jeff, I had a question about anyone dry hopping ciders. I could say yes, I've seen them on the market for a while now. Um, it's a really fun thing. Yeah, me too. Um, in fact, uh, Larry Mobby up here, he uh, has Mobby's Winery. He had a, uh, he, he only makes sparkling um, wine, kind of champagne style. He had one a few years ago. It was just a, just a real quick short run. It was um, Madagascar vanilla beans soaked in bourbon with Centennial hops. And it was freaking delicious. And I keep saying, man, you got to make that again. And he's just, he just laughs. So I don't know why he doesn't, but yeah, there's a lot of that happening, Jeff. And I think, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, they taste good. Yeah. One comment I had too about the survey results, um, on those bar charts is like farm brewery legislation was really polarizing. Extremely so. Yeah, I'll have to go back and look at that. Um, and I think part of that might have been due to, uh, I saw a, a conversation with the New York has that big farm brewery legislation. And um, part of the issue with that was they had one person basically policing it in the entire state. And so it was really difficult to uh, ensure that you know, the, the brewers that said they were using local were actually using local. Um, but I'm not, I'd have to delve back into that to see uh, what that means. Because farm brewery legislation in New York is different than it is in a different state, different than a different state. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still undecided. I thought I was in favor of it before and keep flip-flopping on it. But yeah, we are, we are not New York. Our laws are already True. very different true yeah uh, i'd like to follow up on the future of data collection as it relates to terroir and quantification you know so you know it's i think it's probably one of the more difficult uh things to quantify and we you know we may yeah. never that's that's fine too but i'd also like to you know uh i i understand there were many parameters that led to the chem chemistry and of the flavor in the beers but uh, you know, there's still going to be some some pretty simple, uh, steep methods where you could do a, a lot more testing with a lot more samples if you didn't have to brew it every time, and be able to you know uh, understand what uh, well drained soils versus poorly drained soils or or uh, new you know certain nutrients over other nutrients. So I just want to understand could you could you comment on what the future uh, research might look like and what the plans are. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, if we, yeah, if we didn't have to brew five barrels of beer every time in order to, um, that would save quite a bit of time. And I'm sure there's ways to, to go about doing that, like you mentioned. Um, so yeah, our, as far as the research that we're working on, um, we're hoping to have. Uh, in fact, I just talked to Alec Mull yesterday. And I think the uh, members of the Hop Quality Group are going to be coming up to Michigan in the in June sometime. In addition to doing their farm audits, um, they're going to help do some of the sensory uh, with us, and then we'll we'll just take that sensory information, um, make a take a or take those hops, make a composite sample, so we have like a. Here's what a typical I'd say typical because even every year is different, but. A, uh, uh, 2020 harvest uh, cascade hop flavor wheel looks like for Michigan in comparison with these other states uh, at least as far as the, the information is out there we can make those comparisons um, and then provide that to each of the growers that submitted samples so that they have that and then also run analytics on all of those hops because um, we're trying to get the growers to start thinking about hey here's another way for you guys to sell your hops um, if the if the brewers are saying i really like that michigan chinook because it's less piney and uh, more mandarin orange you know if you as a grower said well here's why or at least here's we 
why we think that is, and here's some information to back that up. Um, that's kind of what we have in the near term. Um, and, you know, a few years out, I would love to, like you said, try to decipher what factors play a role in kind of determining that overall aroma. Um, and the other thing I didn't mention is, you know, the, like the human component is also huge, like, you know, picking time, uh, drying quality, uh, all of that, you know, your fertility regime, when you water, when you stop watering. So you're right, there's, there's so many factors. Um, one of the things that came up in, in talking with Alex is uh, it would be awesome to get, you know, some sort of like machine learning um, tool that, that can just take all of this data and kind of synthesize it down to, well, here's a correlation, here's a correlation worth investigating, but I don't know enough about that. Um, I have to have someone who, who knows way more than me about that to get, but that's kind of, you know, a few years out. Very cool. Um, Colin, back to the renaming um, according to what's characteristic of the hop itself. When I was working briefly in a, in a homebrew store, it, it was during like a real big pinch on galaxy hops coming from Australia. So we'd have homebrewers coming in like, ah, oh, you're out of galaxy. Yep. What can you recommend instead? I would always go straight for Michigan Chinook, mostly hmm. just because I tried to trick them into buying a Michigan product. But actually, they were very happy with the, the results and the like, cool. pineapple character they got out of it was, yeah, that's what they were looking for. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I, would, I You know, that's the stuff that it kind of intrigues me is like, OK, well, how is that? What what are the similarities from an analytical perspective? And and from a, a growing perspective like i mean we're talking with alex again he, like what if it's the the wavelength of the light when they're at burst age or something you know just so many factors to to consider but that's a really that's another good thing that that growers should know um when they're talking to brewers is this is a great substitute for x or x um so thanks for doing that yeah, it was cool. And it actually saved the money, too, because they were yeah. quite a bit cheaper. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Galaxies. And more sustainable. They don't have to get shipped from the other side of the planet. Yeah. Uh, just to add on to Michael's question about uh, high throughput analysis, you know, that's something that's also challenging in the barley world uh, where, you know, the traditional malt quality, I mean, just even doing malt analysis on things you know, on, you know, thousands of samples is pretty rigorous and there's always been research on trying to how to like scale that down. Um, and there has been a malt assessment, uh, sensory assessment called the hot steep that I'll talk about a little bit, but, you know, we're still even trying to figure out how that really trends to beer. Um, and if there are, you know, metabolite markers in hot steeps or in grain that would uh, come through in the final beer and then trying to move that down the line so we can actually do this in a high throughput way. And I know that's the same thing that they're looking at at hops. Um, the Shell Hammer Lab here is doing a lot of hop grind and they've really settled on that method as their preferred sensory method. Um, but even that has its challenges because um, I'm, I get to sit on their sensory panel and when you're doing 10 hop grind samples, you know, it's by sample number five, you're kind of fried. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a real challenge to do these raw material sensory things. And yeah. that is something that is not kept up to like caught up with the demand for unique flavor profiles. Yeah. And I, I'd also add that, you know, there's there, when you're looking at that GC uh, readout, the, uh, the human nose is, is way better than um, some of the equipment that they have. So you can detect things and there's not even a peak there. So yeah, that's, I can see that after, Several, doing several of those, how you'd be like, okay, I, they're all starting to blend together. But is there a They all way? smell hoppy. Yeah, right. <laughs> and delicious. Unless you're Ryan. No offense, Ryan. Yeah, then it just smells like respiratory failure. <laughs> I'm allergic to hops. In case anyone on the call didn't already know. Most of you do, I think. <laughs> well. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for being here, Rob. Uh, Rob yeah. has to go um, enjoy an awesome basketball game on a Friday. So thank I'll you. I'll be right now. You got it. Thanks, guys. Take care. All right. Uh, next up is Mr. Campbell Morrissey. 
uh, from Oregon State University, and he's going to give us the barley component of terroir. And there's been a, a, a lot of research been going on for, I think, well over five years now at Oregon State, um, tying um, flavor characteristics and markers um, to terroir and place and genotype and, and all that stuff. But I'll stop rambling and, and let him take it away. Yeah, unlike hops, um, you know, we barley has always been, you know, associated with flavor through the malting process. Um, and so, you know, just a rough estimate, I'd say traditionally people accounted, attributed about 95% of malts flavor to the malting process and about 5% to, you know, barley type, growing location, et cetera. Whereas the complete opposite with hops, you know, 95% of the attributes would come to the fact that it's a Cascade or a Chinook, whereas 5% might be that actual processing step of, you know, picking, drying, kilning, and then, you know, downstream processing, be it just pelletizing or all the way into various extracts and things like that. Um, we're starting to see that change on both sides. So I think that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, to Ryan's point about five years ago, the well, a little before that, um, the OSU started what we're calling the flavor project. And that was really spurred on by a group of professional brewers who, wanted to explore the value of barley genotype to malt flavor and malt quality. And so through there, we've done a, a whole host of studies. And in my slides, I'll talk a little bit about our workflow. Um, and then I'll talk specifically about a project I'm working on um, that's exploring barley, barley malt and beer or malt and beer flavor um, in different genotypes grown at three different locations uh, with two different soil management techniques. So um, I'll just share my screen really quick. Does everyone see that okay? Cool, thanks. Uh, so yeah, generally, you know, I always think of this as kind of this interaction effect of, you know, if you put the same barley variety in different locations or treat it differently, what is gonna happen and how are we gonna see, can we see some discernible differences in both malt and beer flavor and then malt and beer chemistry? So this is a, you know, OSU barley project is pretty unique. Um, we are first and foremost a barley breeding operation. Um, you know, moving things through the typical uh, selection process of, you know, stress resistance, disease resistance, yield, you know, ag agronomic improvements. Uh, but what we're unique in is we actually have a uh, malting facility on campus. Uh, so we have both a micro malting where we can do 500 gram samples. Um, we're set up to do eight of those at a time. And then we have a mini malter where we can do 100 kilo batches. And what that really allows us to do is work with brewers on a small scale still. Um, but actually produce beer from some of our trial lines. Um, so this is pretty unique and something that we're really uh, fortunate to have. Additionally, you know, across the street is the Shellhammer Lab, and they have a really sweet uh, two and a half hectoliter brew house um, that allows for a lot of flexibility in beer design and then beer throughput. So a lot of beers are getting pushed through there, mostly for in hop research, but every so often they allow us to uh, get a little time in there and get some barley focused beers on the schedule. So when I think about terroir, you know, I don't want to go too too deep into this, but you know, I think especially with barley, it really comes down to two different things. You know, we have our kind of indirect flavor outcomes, which I think are generally well understood um, in the grand scheme of things, um, but those are really tied to malt quality parameters and then kilning. So you know, malt quality that's our you know specifically our fan component, fermentability. Um, and then just overall beta glucan and viscosity issues. Cause while those might not be flavor active compounds, they're gonna really impact the sensory uh, experience of a beer. So if you're having trouble clearing up a beer during downstream filtration, um, that beer is not gonna meet sensory spec of a light lager, for example. So I do try to tie those things in because I think they're really important um, is that visual aspect. Um, and then further kilning, obviously when we're talking about color, um, you know, may our reaction products um, and just that overall kilning regime where you can produce a whole host of, of different flavors based on, you know, air on and air off temperatures and then humidity uh, coming across. So that I think, you know, obviously there's still a lot of room for exploration in that field of science, but the direct flavor outcomes, I think is where we're still trying to grab hold of. And so what is that metabolite contribution from the grain itself? You know, exploring all the different metabolic pathways that can be influenced by growing location and environment. Um, you know, so some things we've identified early on is that, 
you know, grain and malt will have different concentrations of fatty acids and different types of fatty acids. So these can lead to producing esters, um, different flavor active esters, especially, um, which are typically associated with fermentation profile. But if you're starting with like a baseline of one ester versus the other, you're, you have something that you can build upon. Um, further phenols, um, phenols are, you know, fairly well known to be flavor active and this can tie down to like cell wall constituent compounds and how those are liberated during the malting process. So now we're getting into that gray area of, well, it's the precursors from the grain, but then the malting actually liberates them. You know, what's, can we control those different things? And I think the cool thing about barley is we have multiple levers we can pull throughout that process. Um, and then finally, the one I just wanted to include because I was following the hop guy um, is that we are seeing um, barley variety varying in the amount of terpenes and some flavor active terpenes associated with hops. Um, we're not gonna have this like huge citrus pine uh, rose like bomb coming from a, you know, a, a typical barley variety. But again, that can be kind of a background player and give some contributions there. Um, and one interesting thing is that we may understand the genetic contributions of those a little differently. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, and then further, this is uh, the argument I've been having, you know, for years is just understanding what's actually in our fan profile and the, what the barley contribution in uh, protein and amino acid content and structure that that's contributing to that um, because we are very comfortable understanding that yeast will uptake amino acids preferentially and you know leaving excess proline for example in a beer can cause a lot of off flavors downstream if we can control that genetically um, I think that's very appealing to brewers and again not the coolest flavor compounds when we're talking about six month old beer and having different staling profiles but I think this is a huge uh, area of of interest for me and a huge area of interest from the industry. So how have we been doing all this? Um, well, we have this kind of established pipeline um, between that we're leading the charge here at Oregon State, but we've been working closely with Colorado State um, and their metabolomics lab um, to actually do the metabolite analysis. So we can malt, as I said, uh, 500 gram batches up to 100 kilo batches. So it gives us a lot of ability to do high throughput malting although it still takes a long time. Um, I've done 64 batches this year so far. Uh, and you know the larger scale malting work can actually turn those into beers. The nice thing is, and I mentioned a little in the discussion is that we have this fairly recent tool um, that's been, this method has been released by the American Society of Brewing Chemists. It's the hot steep evaluation method. We're still not really sure um, what the sensory outcomes are gonna tell us in the sense of impact of beer. But we do know that we can identify differences between malt types and between barley varieties of the same malt type. Um, and the nice thing is that they, when they released this, they also found that it was very repeatable and reproducible. So this is a fairly robust tool. Um, it's very easy, uh, which is appealing both to me and to the industry wide because pretty much any brewer or maltster can set this up with the tools they have available to them. Um, it's not an exp expensive uh, chemical analysis and it doesn't even require the the advanced equipment you would need to do a typical Congress mash, for example. Uh, so very appealing there, um, but also very robust. And then finally, we send all of our samples, both our hot steeps and our beers to Colorado State, where we'll do both volatile and non-volatile analysis. Uh, to, up till now, we've been focusing on non-targeted analyses and really just kind of getting a broad spectrum of what is in there and kind of relative abundance to each other in a semi-quantitative method. But uh, further studies um, we've been talking about is we're actually going to finally be able to start narrowing this down and start doing targeted quantitative analysis, which I think will give us a really nice idea of what we're working with um, and seeing kind of what we've seen over the last five years. So what am I working on? Um, well, <clears throat> I'm working on what we call the BANT. It is the Brewers Association Nitrogen Trial. We're big on acronyms and then spinning all of those acronyms into puns. Uh, so if you hear some bad puns uh, coming up, you know, rest assured, this is part of the process. Uh, so generally we're looking at how barley genotype contributes to beer flavor um, and through that environmental interaction and the nitrogen treatment interaction. Um, but what we're really also adding to this is that can this approach be included in our standard pipeline of line development? You know, is there a method, you know, to Michael's point of high throughput analysis or you know, identification of lines that may not have made, you know, the typical, made it all the way through that uh, line 
line or a variety release pipeline in the sense that, you know, maybe it didn't have the best agronomics, but it was okay, or it doesn't meet a malt quality spec as called out by our traditional malt quality um, guidelines. So adding kind of another, another look or another lens that we can look through to be able to see that, you know, is really important, I think, to capture some lines that probably would have just gotten tossed. Um, so we're working with seven different variety or seven different experimental lines or six lines and one name variety, Thunder, um, or two now, Lightning is now named and released, um, and then five experimental lines. Um, and we use doubled haploid systems here at to create homozygotes here at OSU. So everything with the DH is one of ours. Um, and then the year the the year it was made is the the first two digits. So 2014 uh, primarily or 2014 for all of these. And then you know we're doing a few thousand a year. So that's where the last four digits come from. Um, we're planting them at three growing locations. So last year or in 2019 planting, we're all these are all winter habit. Sorry, I should have specified that. Um, we grew in Corvallis, Pendleton, and Tule Lake, California. Um, and then in 2020, we planted in Corvallis, Tule Lake again, uh, but then we removed the Pendleton site and added Aberdeen, Idaho. Um, the Pendleton site, unfortunately, was kind of giving us a lot of weed pressure. Um, I can confirm that goat grass can be malted, uh, but that's mostly, I don't know how good the quality is, but we did pull a lot of goat grass out of our samples. Um, and then the Aberdeen, Idaho also gives us the advantage of that is kind of the center of, you know, uh, malt quality barley, you know, in the, in the Rocky Mountain region and kind of west. Um, and there's a lot of industrial influence there. So that, you know, be it Bush Ag, Great Western. Um, and so we get to really partner with them and talk to them, which I think is really beneficial. And then finally, we're doing two nitrogen regimes. So uh, we're using what we call N1 and N2. Um, which is a standard application, um, not really anything special from what we normally do. And we're targeting same uh, soil N at all locations or total, so, total, total N after soil measurements. And then we're doing a secondary application um, at tillering. So seeing how that actually impacts malt quality. We're not trying to like jack it up. I have a, another small project um, that I'll talk about at the end where we're really trying to push up protein levels. Uh, but this is just looking for more of a response and malt quality and flavor response to that. So again, what's interesting about this one is that typically we've done what we call kind of research malt and research beer. And that is really just code for boring malt and boring beer. Um, you know, the understanding was that we'd want, you know, we want to keep these things as basic as possible so that we can pull any identifiable flavors between the difference. You know, I think it'd be hard to tell honey variety in different raspberry lemon meads um, versus like a base mead. Um, however, <laughs> what we're finding is that any flavor differences we do pull is very nuanced. And, you know, we kind of want to see, okay, well, we know that there's nuanced flavor difference between barley variety and that can be identified between using at different malt modifications as well as at different growing locations. So the question is, can we emphasize any of these flavor differences by manipulating levers downstream? And so that is first going to be in the malting process and then in the brewing process. So we're, for these two projects in the two years, we're actually using kind of more commercial type malt and commercial type beer. So for this year, um, we're gonna be doing a Pilsner type malt. So we're actually shooting for a, you know, what, what people these days would say under modification, um, but kind of a, the modification level associated with a continental European type Pilsner malt. So reducing the uh, total S over, or S over T ratio, reducing our fan, um, and we're finding that's actually a little more challenging than we expected um, because so much of our pipeline is bred for uh, the <clears throat> AMBA recommendation. And so finding those varieties and seeing how they mani are manipulated um, in the malting house, in malt house is really interesting. And I think we're actually, we're hitting it on some and not quite on others. And then in year two, we're going to uh, up the kiln a little bit, um, you know, and so we're going to brew, and this actually came out of a project we did with some Maris Otter progeny and thinking about, okay, well, like, you know, what if we're kilning to what we would call an English pale or Vienna type? So it's not, you know, big, dark malt, but it's going to have, you know, four to five SRM as opposed to, you know, one to two. And so really seeing if we can see an emphasis on, uh, in these Maillard reaction products, because we already do see a little bit of difference, even in the low kiln malts between each other. And we want to just see if those kind of like group more closely together and that kilning kind of just, you know, washes everything out. Or if we see 
uh, even accentuated, you know, bread, toasty notes and the ones that were a little higher anyway. And if just building on that base allows us to find those further differences. Um, and then these will all, so all everything will go through the micro malter and that does get just kind of a standard protocol. Um, we do use two standard protocols. Um, we've been suffering a lot of water sensitivity in Corvallis lately um, and not as much as in our other ones. So we just try to make those as even as possible just to get kind of our you know shotgun approach to malt quality to seeing what's happening between the lines. And then the mini malter is where we'll actually develop that bespoke profile to monitor water uptake. Um, we're taking moisture samples very, uh, you know, consistently throughout the process to just, and then actually adjusting the parameter as we go along to hit certain steep out moistures. And then these will all get beer, uh, brewed, <coughs> excuse me, at uh, Deschutes Brewing. So also fortunate that we have a lot of big breweries like you do in Michigan um, that are really keen on research and really like just talking about cool stuff. So this is just a little more about what were uh, the malt types that we're shooting for. Um, you know, as I mentioned with the kilning, um, we're not pushing it too high and we're not trying to promote any caramel and melanoidin excessive character. Um, so we're just kind of going in a hot dry kiln. Um, thankfully I've been able to talk with professional maltsters who are kind of helping me design this process and I'm able to use our CLP when it's free. That's the micro malter to kind of optimize a protocol for that. And so this could be really exciting because if we can figure out you know, nice optimized protocols, we can even start applying this in the CLP for a more of a, you know, population wide survey. So I just wanted to share a little bit of our early data. Um, like I said, this project is in uh, process. And so, you know, I don't have everything right now, uh, but just kind of what we've seen so far, um, <clears throat> we've seen that location does have quite a bit of effect on our protein levels. Um, so again, same, same genotypes, um, same soil and except for the, the treatments. Um, but we're seeing a different kind of spread. Whereas, you know, here in the Pendleton uh, crop, we're seeing generally high protein, but we see kind of a nice, like, you know, decrease as we go through the genotypes. Um, whereas Thule Lake and Corvallis seem to be a little bit all over the place um, where we're not seeing as, as much consistency. Although I will say across the board, N2 is higher than N1, except for that one instance here where lightning did, uh, the N1 was able to actually surpass the N2 in grain protein. And then, but generally we're able to keep them all within all malt spec for brewing. So what's cool is we finally have some malt quality data. Um, we got the first half of our data and our, our data back from uh, Hartwood College where we do all of our malt analysis. And this is kind of a really uh, crazy graph, but uh, I was hoping it would kind of spur a little bit of our discussion, um, our banter, if you will. Had to get one point in there. Um, but as we look, as we move across our lines, and this is just a few of the lines that we're working on this year, um, we really see a pretty you know, consistent uh, connection between beta-glucan and cell wall modification and uh, fan and protein modification. This isn't necessarily unexpected. Um, you know, in fact, it's fairly to be expected. However, not all lines perform the same way. So it was interesting to me to kind of see a fairly perfect uh, level of modification. Um, and this is just those CLPs. So this is the standard protocol across the board. When we do actually get them into the mini malter, we're seeing a little bit of a different uh, pattern. Um, but really interesting to just see that, you know, generally from location to location, we're not seeing huge malt quality differences. Um, and so this would indicate that, you know, genotype is gonna be most descriptive of our, of our malt quality profile. We'll see, we're seeing some, um, but time will tell to see if we're actually gonna see major significant differences and where the variation is being explained. And then uh, when we look at genotype by treatment, um, really seems to kind of even out um, across the treatments we do see you know, to be expected some of the protein things changing a little bit. What I find the most interesting, um, and this yellow line kind of shows it, um, it's hard to tell on the scale of this graph, but as treatment goes up or the treatment, the higher, higher treatment, we're actually seeing a higher soluble to total nitrogen ratio in the malt. And so that's something I wanna look at a little farther, or a little deeper into as we kind of understand like how does exogenous nitrogen impact our malt quality 
you know, by, and how does it changing that protein modification, you know, so it's like, you know, are we seeing different amino acid constituents being built in the grain that is affecting how we're able to, to malt that, uh, malt that because S over T and fan are kind of two of those things that brewers are looking at um, for malt quality um, and are going to be targeting for not only they're kind of really, you know, industrial minded two row malts, but also are going to look at for uh, more, you know, specialty base malts, such as your Pilsner malts, like we were talking about earlier, you know, and that spec is quite a bit different for those two things. So I really want to see how this, this plays out in the, you know, in the, in the big analysis. And then as we start getting into those beers, uh, because this is, uh, I think, a kind of a really interesting way to go. And we also know how a lot of these things can impact flavor. So lastly, um, I do have another project that's related to terroir. Um, again, another acronym. This is the Distillers Delight Trial. This is a, a project with Great Western Malting to analyze genotypes that might be able to, we might actually be able to use terroir essentially to manipulate the grain in such a way that we can get two distinctly different types of malt from the same grain um, or from, from the same grain variety. And so we're exploring eight different genotypes um, across two locations. Um, that's Corvallis and Aberdeen, Idaho again. Um, this time we're using three nitrogen treatments, uh, standard, a high, and then a high plus a flowering addition. Um, and we're gonna give them two different malting protocols. So we're looking to see if we can find a genotype that would produce a kind of low protein, high extract malt geared for all malt distilling, but then a high enzyme, high protein, a uh, high fan malt for high enzyme and high enzyme adjunct distilling. And so <clears throat> this seems kind of crazy and maybe it is, um, but so far we're seeing just kind of some interesting lines and this is just some data aggregation from our kind of data pool of things that we use to select for this project. But um, so we, we kind of have, we're, this is just six of the lines we've since added to, uh, but the kind of genotype by grain protein model shows that genotype does control total grain protein um, quite a bit, but we're even seeing quite a bit of spread once you start getting those treatments in and treatment has a fairly large effect, 26% um, in explaining uh, the difference in grain protein. So um, here, you know, is the DH170417. And that's kind of our, our candidate, we think that could be the one that gets us to where we want because we're almost at 11% on the low protein and then over 13% on the high treatment or a high nitrogen treatment. So that could really be a nice one. And just by using that nitrogen treatment lever to create a grain that's suitable for all types of malt. Um, <clears throat> then lastly, you know, I just highlighted these other two. Sorry, my like computer's connected to a phone and like, so my whole world is connected and I don't know how to turn any of it off. Um, but the last two over here are just kind of highlighting ones that would be really suited just for one or the other. And so just to kind of give a range, and those are really going to kind of bracket our analysis. Um, I did include yield because obviously that's a really important thing, especially as we're working with an industrial purveyor to, to look at, you know, malt quality, uh, malt quality specs that would fit. Um, but we're seeing not much treatment effect. You know, 1% of the effect of yield is related to treatment. Um, so that's really, that was really interesting to me. I would have not, that would have not been my initial expectation. Um, and we'll see how that plays out over multiple locations. So I'm just gonna, I guess I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so that was kind of a lot. Um, you know, a lot of our research is kind of in early stages or at least my research is, uh, but we have a lot of work that we can build on thankfully um, to kind of keep exploring, you know, the effect of terroir on barley genotype, um, especially in the, in the Pacific Northwest and then Mountain West regions. Awesome. Thank you very much. We got a couple questions already. Um, on a, we have one question in the chat so far. So uh, it's from Vince. Um, the protein comparisons early on, were those uh, dry land, irrigated, or both? Uh, great question. Uh, those were all of, so those are both. Um, we don't irrigate in Corvallis um, because it irrigates itself because it's so wet. Um, <laughs> as I was lamenting earlier, I moved from drier climate. <laughs> it rains all the time. Um, whereas <clears throat> Tule Lake does irrigate, um, Pendleton did not irrigate. So Tule Lake, uh, Klamath Basin, 
uh, also fairly dry, uh, but they do irrigate. And then uh, Pendleton did not irrigate. So quite a bit different. And that we will be irrigating in Aberdeen. Um, so we won't have a dry land this year. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'd like to point out too that uh, Aberdeen, Idaho is the home of the USDA small grains uh, collection. Uh, there's another attendee in the other room. Would you please turn off your right here? <laughs> Um, yeah, Jeff, uh, actually dropped his, uh, contact information in the chat, uh, for, um, collaboration in the future or assistance in fermentation research. Uh, so, yeah. All right. Um, oh, cool. that's all the questions in the chat, but yeah, let's open it up to, to discussion for the floor there. Well, I, I can go, I guess, if that's okay. Hey, um, thanks, thanks, Ryan. Hey, absolutely excellent work. Seriously, um, I and uh, right from the beginning when when you said Pilsner malt's really challenging, I personally believe Pilsner malt's the most challenging there is. Um, that's and that's why I always try to that's why I always try to to make that a possibility first. Um, yeah, I I I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to know. Uh, are, are you thinking that your ideal, your ideal barley is going to produce both Pilsner and English ale Vienna um, with the, the different uh, protein levels? Or do you think you're going to be doing different varieties uh, for that? Uh, so we will be using the same varieties, um, you know, just to keep that consistent. But we do want to see you know, in a perfect world, we would actually, we would see one that was like a standout sensory difference for Pilsner and one that was a standout sensory difference in, for the Vienna English pale type, because it would just give us some more insight into, okay, like barley genotype is really going to play well with the levers being pulled in malting. Like, you know, I, I just don't think at this point, we're going to find like some, like, you know, my advisor always says, um, we're not going to find fragrant, the fragrant rice gene in barley. There's not just like one smoking gun that's going to say this is a really flavorful barley and this isn't. We're going to find kind of that there's a spectrum of opportunity to develop flavor in the final product using all the levers we have available to us from grain selection through to uh, brewing. Awesome. Um... Uh, vote of confidence for Pilsner malt from Jeff, I might add in the chat. Uh, so, um, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I had a question there ready too. But um, yeah, so uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about too, that's not necessarily related to barley terroir, is uh, you're um, back in the brewing industry part time. Uh, you want to tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah, so I, for a long time, was a professional brewer who was moonlighting as an academic, uh, a little towards the end of my brewing, first brewing stint. Um, so I've been in the brewing industry for about 10 years, so I should kind of uh, clarify that. Um, and then got into academia full time, um, taking a research position in Dr. Hayes's lab here, um, but have, and did that this for about a year and then have since accepted a full time brewing job um, in Hood River, Oregon and I will be doing this part-time. So I don't really value free time. Um, so this is a really great opportunity to, uh, to just do a whole bunch of really cool stuff. Um, and I use that like cool stuff a lot because this is like everything in brewing is super cool. Um, and I really like to be able to apply the kind of raw material knowledge that I've been fortunate enough to receive and kind of research uh, into the brewing side of things um, and, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, we're so well suited because, you know, we do grow, we don't grow that much barley in Oregon, but, you know, Washington grows like 5% of malting barley. And obviously we're centered in hop country. Um, and then Idaho is not that far away. We're about eight hours from Aberdeen in Hood River. So we kind of have it all here, just like you all have in Michigan, um, which is why this is so exciting. And just to hear, you know, Rob's presentation earlier on hop terroir in Michigan, I just think, you know, admittedly it's always tough to like talk to hop growers in the smaller states um 
you know, assuming that they're going to produce Northwest Cascade or Chinook, it's like you have to start embracing the things that are going to happen in your your local, you know, agronom agronomy, if you will. Um, but then also being able to start hearing about just like, you know, maximizing aroma attributes and also like talking about developing different cultivars. Yeah, I was actually <clears throat> um, talking to a, a guy on the phone the other day who was, he had called me to ask about planting small grains for uh, malting or distilling, but we got on the topic of hops, as so happens. Um, and he was saying that he was considering planting hops uh, some number of years ago, but the initial costs were you know, not something he was very keen on. And then he brought up that, you know, back then everyone was saying, oh, you got to plant cascades, plant cascades. That's what all the brewers want is cascades. Well, it turned out that all the brewers didn't really want cascades um, moving forward. Um, and, it, you know, that brought home to like, well, you know, agronomically, what's going to work for you isn't necessarily going to interface and mesh well what, with what your client's going to want. Um, and meshing with what Rob was saying too. And that was when everyone was saying plant cascades, that was before we knew what wonderful flavor profile um, Chinooks have in Michigan. And we're seeing that with Crystal too. Michigan Crystals are really nice. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more varieties coming to the forefront in local production here that aren't necessarily um, well known and highly sought after when they're grown out in Oregon or Washington or or in the, the traditional hop growing centers of the US. Pretty neat stuff. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I've been done hop selection enough times to know that the same variety is going to, you know, give you huge onion garlic in one, from one farm and, you know, pick date and things like that. And then you get, you know, <clears throat> nice citrus pine from the other same, the other lot. So it's, you know, I think it might just, give some opportunity to like, you know, find those varieties that are the opposite of Citra in, as far as coolness factor. Um, but, you know, give them a chance in a different environment, a completely different environment, you know, such as Michigan and see what's, what's able to come up or using those as breeding stock um, as develop as lines are in development. Um, you know, because obviously there's only so many lines to work with and you got to kind of pick those. So, I mean, it, I, I think that is one of the challenging things if we do find some real interesting things about barley genotype contribution, but also terroir, you know, because I think one of the great things about the malting barley pipeline prior to this is that, you know, the AMBA pipeline is really trying to find varieties that work in a lot of different locations um, and give a lot of options for growers um, who are going to pick up a variety that a malter, a malter will want and have some sort of kind of guarantee that they're going to see a return on that investment. You know, whereas if we start moving away to kind of more bespoke and specialty varieties, you know, you take a little bit of that insurance out of the out of the equation. And so, you know, it's not going to be one or the other. We're going to have to kind of work together at that. You know, I, you know, Ryan, I know you're very keyed into craft malting things, but, you know, a lot of craft malters are still using Copeland um, because that's a very reliable variety. Um, you know, it could be scary to, to change things up and then lose a contract or, you know, make some bad malt one year because we haven't vetted it completely in all, in all different locations and we don't know how it's going to perform. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had another call um, and it was, it was about barley this time, but it was, um, it was a maltster who he's also the head brewer at a brewery here in Michigan. Um, and he's been building his malt house for a number of years and he fell into the job of, of being a brewer at his local brewery. So Basically, he's vertically integrated those two things. Um, so his malt house only serves the brewery he works at, and that's kind of a perfect scenario, right? Well, <clears throat> our prime pick for spring two rows here is LCS Odyssey. It does really well. But the grower that he's working with decided that he wanted to go back to growing Pinnacle. And it seems counterintuitive the way the industry is going here because a lot of folks didn't like Pinnacle for a number of reasons. Um, it's disease prone, it, um, the husk stains, it's high beta glucan. There's a lot of things to not like about Pinnacle, right? Well, this grower has great success with Pinnacle on his land compared to Odyssey. He had higher yields um, in his specific area. Um, he had better straw off of it. 
and was just generally more happy with Pinnacle's performance. So I can't really argue with that. For me to say, no, it's a it's not a great barley. You need to be growing this doesn't make sense in his particular instance. So you need to trust the grower in that aspect. From the maltster's point of view, he said, yeah, Pinnacle's performed great for me. I don't have a problem with it. This is what my grower wants to grow and I support him. And I, I applaud that relationship where they're actually productively communicating with and finding what works for both of them together instead of one dictating to the other what they should be doing. Um, so yeah, that progression of finding the right barley for your farm isn't necessarily linear and going from the past into the future in it. Yeah. And also finding a, a maltster who's willing to kind of coax quality out of barley. I mean, there's tons of barley that you know, don't, won't necessarily fit your standard protocol, but if you are working with it and you're willing to work with it, you can get really good malt out of it. Um, and so that's kind of, again, back to what we were talking about earlier is like, I think this is just giving us another lens to look through so that when we're, we're not necessarily tossing lines that have some potential, they just don't have potential in, a, in the standard pipeline that we've established. Yeah, absolutely. And if it's one thing I've learned from craft malt, um, be prepared to coax. <laughs> Got to coax everything. <laughs> I'm sorry, it wouldn't be a Zoom call if my cat didn't hop on up onto my lap. Oh yeah, That's okay. our cat got sick of sitting on, on my lap about halfway through, so he's gone now. So. Well, I have a quick question about uh, the. I, I see certainly nitrogen, you know, in the nascent decision to to pick some parameter, but what other, what other uh, agronomic parameters relative to flavor, uh, you know, are, are the future of the research projects or constant conceptually. And then um, you know, the, the differences of, uh, you know, the, we have one, one genetic uh, variety uh, testing over a greater ge geographic region, you know, of North America as a minimum uh, including Canada, you know, we like to see, that's where I think we're going to see more differences and, and uh, Michigan is lucky, as I've said it last week, Michigan's lucky to be in the far side of the corn belt here, but New York is a good example, which is, uh, you can't be in a barley room without hearing microclimate, you know, in every other conversation or every conversation, excuse me. So, uh, you know, that's why I'm looking at the future of the research, how to standardize that and get into a wider geographic uh, distribution of the, of the research so that there could be uh, chemical compounds that we could research to look at uh, that might, might actually be flags for something we're doing here. Totally. I mean, I think the beautiful thing is, you know, like New York, Oregon is all types of different climates. I mean, you go east of the Cascades and you're in high desert and you know, you're know you moving up in elevation, you're moving way down in rainfall. Um, whereas here we're super low, it's about a hundred feet. It rains every day. Um, you know, it's just a completely different growing environment. Um, but you know, traditionally the AMBA pipeline includes the winter, well, we're in the winter malting barley trials where we're growing a lot of our elite germplasm across the country um, and getting performance data there. Um, you know, we haven't moved that flavor stuff into that yet, but as I was alluding to earlier with the, uh, the kind of scope of the BANT trial is that a lot of this stuff is in that, uh, in that pipeline. Um, so at various stages of the uh, malting barley trials, but also kind of even in the AMBA uh, pilot program right now. And so we will have agronomic data on that. We're not gonna like take those to sensory and brewing uh, assessments yet, um, but this is gonna give us a little more of work on that versus like some just like completely experimental germplasm. Um, but yeah, I mean, just even being able to grow in Oregon and kind of surrounding here, like go from, you know, go six hours south to the Klamath Basin, going eight hours east to Idaho. I mean, you know, you're in two different, you're three different worlds. Um, so I think we get some really good insight into what, how things will perform, you know, in the Great Plains um, in kind of like wet, low area, you know, it's not exactly like New York, um, but, you know, it is more akin to East Coast uh, in the Willamette Valley, and then seeing that kind of low, like high desert down in um, climate basin area. So it's not perfect, but I think it gives us a really good insight there. 
And, and what was your other question? Kind of what other levers we're pulling from like a, a terroir standpoint? Yeah, if there was, uh, I mean, again, I can see what I said. I see why nitrogen was chosen, but what other choices are on the horizon relative to flavor? Uh, yeah, so to be honest, I'm not the agronomic side of this whole thing. I'm the, the beer guy. Uh, so I don't have a ton of insight into that. Um, as of now, we don't have a plan to really change that other than just the inherent changes of growing regions. So that's rainfall, um, irrigation versus not. Um, soil and just what the you know soil constituency outside of nitrogen is in that area. Um, I think it was Rob that was talking about thiols, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, real. Uh, that's that could be sulfur driven. So soil sulfur composition. Um, I'm sure it has some sort of effect on thiols and in, in, in hops, but. Um, I think once we can get a better sense of like what, especially in barley, what those, you know, metabolite markers are that we can start looking at, um, you know, back to the point about, you know, high throughput analysis, you know, if we can do just barley, you know, samples at, and for a non-volatile target, you know, and we know we might be able to start adding that to this, but we're still, we're not we're not there yet to even know what is really going to drive beer flavor. Yeah, it'd be interesting to overlay to um, climatological data year to year um, and look at that with protein level. I mean, we know obviously rainfall patterns have an effect on protein levels, but also how that translates into flavor um, from like a broad fifty thousand feet above view. All right. Um, if we have no further questions and discussion, um, next week we'll have Jesse Bussard here from uh, the Craft Maltsters Guild who will be presenting about craft malt. So I know we end up talking about it nearly every session, but we haven't yet had a, a formal presentation on it and giving us a good overview, both in depth and broad about um, what the craft malting community is, what it is as a movement, what it means to relocalize uh, malting grain value chains and all that. It's something that's obviously on the forefront of all of our minds at all times, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But um, it, it, it'll be nice to hear from Jesse about it um, and dedicate an entire session to that. Um, yeah, so, and I know she's presented at the um, the Michigan Brewers Guild MBA conference this year and at our Great Lakes Hops and Barley conference last year. Um, but it's a, it's a topic that's very important to me and to all of us here. So I think it'll it'll be a great session. Um, yep, yeah, and uh, for anybody who wants Campbell's uh, direct uh, uh, contact information, he just dropped it into the chat and anyone can always reach out to me too. We're, we're in conversation, obviously. Um, thanks everybody for attending and happy Friday. And if it's sunny where you are, get outside and enjoy it because we will be. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thanks Campbell for being here. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for Thank using you. some of your, um, non-preferred, uh, free time <laughs> to talk to us. You know, this is, I'll make the exceptions to talk shop. Thank you for the puns as well. <laughs> There's, there's more. We have a, we just, I submitted a paper that we generally call the romp of otters. That's our Maris otter progeny. So. Lovely. A romp, actually, the, isn't that the term for like a group of otters? That's right. So when you see them in a field, you can just point out that romp. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Good work. Cool, everyone. Have a good Thanks. rest of your day. I still have to go do work, so I can't drink yet. All right. Well, have one for me later. Oh, I will. Cheers, man. Thanks.